So I was uh, thinking about all the superstitions uh, that are out there in our culture today, and, and some of them are very interesting. Uh, so I, I tried this first service. They weren't quite with it first service. So I, I'm, I'm confident that second service is going to be more alert, more awake. I'll give you a superstition that's out there, and you tell me whether it's bad luck or good luck, okay? We'll see how well we do. Okay, so if you pick up a penny, uh, is that good luck or bad luck? Good luck? There we go. Good job. Okay, uh, if you walk under a ladder, that is good luck or bad luck? Bad luck. You guys are good. You guys are with it. If a black cat crosses your path, that's... Bad luck. In fact, I would say any cat crosses your path. That's bad luck. Okay? Um, how about a rabbit's foot? Good that's good luck. Good job. Uh, what about opening an umbrella uh, while inside? Bad. That's bad luck. Okay, and a broken mirror. When that happens, you have how many years of bad luck? There we go. You guys are awesome. Like, we all know these superstitions, right? We grew up with them. Uh, but I started doing some research on some international, some global superstitions, and, and most of these are American. Um, uh, it's interesting, some of the fascinating ones. Like in Japan, there's a superstition that when you are eating with chopsticks, which most of the people in Japan do, uh, is you never are to put your chopsticks straight, just stick them into your food. You are never to do that and just leave it there. Because usually when you do that, the chopsticks actually actually typically form uh, the number in Japanese for four, which is a symbol for death, believe it or not. So in Japan, if you're ever in Japan, don't put your chopsticks, just stick them in, the, uh, in, in your food. That's bad luck. Okay, in Lithuania, here's, a, here's bad news for some of you planning on visiting Lithuania uh, sometime soon, is your, uh, it's bad luck to whistle inside. So no whistling while you work, at least if you're inside working, okay? Uh, here's another one. Here's maybe my all-time favorite is in France. It is, believe it or not, good luck when you step in dog poop. Those France. France is a little different, right? But it's not just a foot. Like in France, it is good luck only if you step in dog poop with your left foot, okay? So when you're about to step in it, you got to make sure it's your left foot. If it's your right foot, it's bad news, okay? Um, here, here's another one. I don't know the infatuation globally with poop, but a, a Russian superstition says that when bird poop comes on your head, when it drops on your head, that's good luck, believe it or not. I've had a son and myself personally, and I can tell you that is not good luck, okay? That is bad luck. But if you're in Russia and you're superstitious, that's very, very good luck. Uh, also, in Syria, uh, superstitions, they've carried it to a whole new level. Uh, they've actually banned yo-yos. Since 1933, if you go to Syria today and you have a yo-yo, uh, you will be arrested because they banned it because they believe that it is, it is superstitious and it's bad to play with yo-yos because it would cause uh, a death and drought in the land, okay? And then the last one, just in case you were wondering, if you are ever in India, they believe that it is superstitious to get your hair cut on a Tuesday, Okay, so, so believe it or not, yeah, so uh, if you're ever in India, do not get your hair cut on a Tuesday. It's bad, bad luck. Um, but, you know, there's all different types of superstitions out there in our world today, right? Some a little crazier than others. Uh, but as Stevie Wonder once sang a song, and he said, superstition ain't the way. And I love that, because that's no more true than in our faith journeys, Right? We, we don't have to, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our spiritual journeys, we don't have to rely on uh, pursuing superstitions and staying away from bad luck things and pursuing good luck things. In fact, we don't have to rely on superstitions at all. We serve a big God who is all powerful, a God who never shies away from doing the supernatural in people's lives. I mean, you flip through the pages of the Bible and over and over and over again, the Bible reveals a God who does the supernatural, a God who does the unthinkable, the impossible. Things like parting the Red Sea, turning a shepherd's staff into a snake, making the sun stand still for an entire 24-hour day. I mean, he does like things like, like, like producing water in the middle of a dry desert by way of a rock. On and on and on, again, we find God doing the impossible. But I know what some of you are probably thinking this morning. 
But Steve, that, that was back in Bible times, right? That God doesn't do those things anymore. Or does he? You see, I, I think that, that so many times in life, we've convinced ourselves that God doesn't do miracles anymore like he did in the Bible times. Listen, you need to all understand, and before we start this entire series, we need to understand that God has always been and always will be a God of miracles. He always has been and he always will be. It's a part of who he is. It's, it's a part of his nature. And not just to simply show off, although God can easily do that, but to reveal himself to us, to reveal his power to us so that we can know him better, so that we can depend on him and trust in him. You see, the problem isn't that God won't do miracles anymore. The problem is we've stopped believing he will. And that's a major problem. In fact, I, I think we as human beings have created, especially in our modern, modern culture, we've created these roadblocks that I believe that actually prevent God from doing miracles in our lives. Let's just talk about a couple of them. Uh, one roadblock is, is being self-reliant, being too self-reliant. We've, we've convinced ourselves that if we work hard enough and we, we, we persevere hard enough and we, we are talented enough, then we can do anything we set our minds to. Nothing is impossible if we just work at it hard enough. And any problem that we have in life can be solved with, with more hard work and more drive and more talent. Self-reliance has become a major roadblock from God doing miracles in my life and in your life. Here's another one. Uh, we, we, we are chance dependent. And what I mean by that is that most of us throughout our lives, uh, we do what we can to get through and then we just roll the dice. We hope it will all turn out. And so when good does happen in our lives, most of the time we will chalk that up, and especially when we can't explain the good or I can't believe how this worked out, we chalk it up as chance or luck or coincidence. And it's a major roadblock for God doing big supernatural things in your life. Uh, here, here's another one. This is the big one, is when we're cynical. See, I think deep down, the truth is most of us really want to believe in miracles, right? We, we want to believe that God can do anything, that God can do the impossible. But yet our practical, logical side tells us different and keeps us from fully embracing the existence of miracles in life. And there's this constant tension that you and I deal with in life. There's this constant uh, friction between wanting to have miracles happen and being cynical of their existence, of their reality. It's like when I watch the show Fool Us. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this or not, but it's a show, uh, it's a magic show from Penn and Teller who are big uh, magicians, been around for 30, 40 years. And what they do is the whole show premise is, is they call in all these famous magicians from around the world and, and, and they say, hey, come up with your best trick and you're gonna try to fool us. And if you can fool us, you will win some special prizes. And so, but if Penn and Teller can understand how you did the trick, uh, then you lose. And every time I watch this show, I love it. And, and, there, and there's this tension going on, right? Because I, 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 I want to see this magician fool Penn and Teller, you know, these gurus of, of magic tricks and illusions. And, and there's a part of me that has this desire also to believe that what they're doing is real, right? That, 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 that there's no sleight of hand, there's no special things. I, I want to believe that this amazing thing that I just saw, it's actually real, it's happening. But then there's the practical, logical side that said there's no way. And I think that's what the tension we deal with in our own lives. But here's the deal. God's magic or God's miracles are not magic. They're not illusions. They are real. And so let me ask you this question as we head into 2019. What would it, what would it take for you this year for you to become more aware of? and more expectant of the miracles of God in your life. Like, just imagine. What would it take 
in 2019 for you to become more aware, more expectant of God doing the supernatural in your life? Well, over the next month here at Journey, we're going to kick off the new year by exploring some of the most uh, mind-blowing acts, supernatural acts you will ever find on planet Earth. And it wasn't done by a magician. They were done by Jesus Christ. Now, something you have to understand about Jesus, uh, he was a magnet for miracles, right? Everywhere he went, he would perform these mind-blowing, eye-opening acts that everyone just said, wow. This man has power. Like he calmed a raging storm. He, he made a blind man see again. He walked on water. He, he, uh, he, he took a dead man and raised him back from the grave. He, he, he was able to take a crippled man and allowed him to walk again. I mean, these were all miracles that would ultimately lead people to believe in him and trust and put their faith in him. And you have to understand, these weren't illusions. They weren't a sleight of hand magic tricks. This was the raw power of God working through his son and working in his son, Jesus Christ. And if Jesus could do all those things, if he could walk on water and calm the sea and feed thousands of people with a few fish and some bread, imagine what he could do in your life. Just imagine what he could do in your life if you remove the roadblocks. I mean, I really believe that God wants to open our eyes over the next month, my eyes, your eyes, so that we can discover what happens when the limitations of life collide with the power of God. By the way, it's a great way of looking at what miracles are. It's not going to be up on the screen. It's not going to be in your notes, but, but, but maybe make a mental note or write it down. This is a great way to view what miracles are. It's when the limitations of life, which we all have, by the way, when the limitations of life collide with the power of God. That's miracles. That's what we're talking about in this series. And so we start with uh, the very first miracle ever performed by Jesus. I mean, this was his premier act And we find it in John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This is what the Bible reads. It says this, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now let me just pause here for a second, because I think there's some important things we need to understand about these wedding celebrations of the first century by the Jews. Uh, So when John says there was a celebration... He means a celebration. It was a week-long wedding celebration, okay? I mean, can you imagine that? 24 hours, seven days of partying. Like our modern weddings, uh, our ceremony might last 30 to 45 minutes, and a good reception, like a, uh, like a really fun reception, might last seven Maybe eight hours, you get, you get out at one o'clock in the morning and you, you're like, that was so much fun, right? But we're talking about a celebration. Back in the first century, the Jews knew how to party. It was seven days, endless supply of food and wine and fun and dancing. Anybody with me on that? Does that sound like fun, right? That sounds like a blast. I mean, these people knew how to celebrate, but who could blame them? Uh, you might be a, you know, a, a stick in the mud and say, oh, that's, a, that's pretty excessive. But a Jew in the first century, uh, there was all kinds of poverty. They had to work hard every day. I mean, who could blame them? So whenever two people got together and they decided to wed each other and the marriage into the commitment and, 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 and the, 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 the community of, of marriage... They invited the whole village and everyone showed up and for seven days, they partied. Partied hard like it was 99. Some of you guys are getting that now. First service, they weren't awake yet. They didn't get it. Here's what I love. Smack dab in the middle of this party. Jesus is there. I love that. Because I think so many times our image, we have this image, like this mundane, boring, vanilla, focus-driven Jesus who had no time for fun, right? 
And I love that John shatters that image that so many of us oftentimes have with Jesus. And he puts Jesus right in the middle of this 168-hour festival. And it reminds me, and it reminds us how pivotal and how critical it is to our faith that we are able to identify everyday Jesus. To be able to identify everyday Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. Most of us in this room, we can identify with Sunday Jesus, right? Because we come to a church building like this, we sing some songs about Jesus, we, we hear a message about Jesus, we, we, we might even talk about Jesus as we're out in the lobby having some coffee, and, and, and we understand, we identify with Sunday Jesus, that's normal for us. But so many times what often happens is, is, is we, take every day, we take Sunday Jesus and we put him on the shelf until the next Sunday. And we need to identify everyday Jesus because everyday Jesus wants to connect with you and engage in every part of your life. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, he wants to be a part of every part of your life. Where you work, where you play, where you have have fun with your family, with your friends. This is so critical for us to understand. That's why part of our vision here at Journey Church is to continually uh, extend the loving touch of Jesus to the surrounding communities. We don't want to just be a church that has a presence of Jesus on Sunday mornings. We want to be a church that has a presence of Jesus every day of the week in the communities that we reach. Some of our target communities are places like Elmhurst and Villa Park and and Bensonville and Lombard and Addison and Glendale Heights and and, and Oak Brook and Oak Brook Terrace and all the communities surrounding this facility. We don't want to just have a presence on Sundays. We want to meet people where they are at and where they're having fun and let people know we want to help you bump into a guy named Jesus. One of the uh, most practical ways that we have done that most recently, uh, the past four years, and for some of you who are new, I think this is important to know why we do what we do, is uh, for the past four years, every March, uh, we have participated, an act of participation in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Elmhurst, which is the second largest uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade in all of Chicagoland, other than the, the city. Thousands and thousands of people show up. Uh, They eat, they drink, they have a good time. There's a lot of music, there's a lot of dancing, there's a lot of throwing of candy and beads, and we are smack dab in the middle of it. We have a float, and we have about 40 to 50 people. We want to invite as many people to come. We have a great time. The band is on the float. They're singing songs that everyone in the crowd knows. Last year, man, they just sang along with us. The band did a great job, and we had 40, 50 people just having a blast by the float, uh, giving out candy and all kinds of stuff with the message of our church, inviting them to come to our church. We even give full-size candy bars to the adults. And I'm telling you, it's like Christmas for the, especially the guys. Like it is the, it is the best thing to be in charge of giving a full candy size bar to uh, an adult. Like they love it, right? Why do we do that? Because we want to be where people are at. We want to help people bump into Jesus every day of the week. So I'm going to encourage you, you're going to hear more details about that and how to get involved with the St. Patrick's Day Parade. We invite our whole church to be a part of that uh, here coming up in March. But it's important to understand that Jesus isn't just a Sunday Savior. He's an everyday Savior who wants to be a part of every uh, aspect of your life. It's critical that you and I acknowledge that. So John has him right in the middle of all this fun and this partying. Right? He, he knows how to have fun. Look what happens, though. Verse 3. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. The worst news you could get, right? I mean, we know how that goes. There's no more alcohol, right? The wine is gone. I mean, can you imagine being there saying, are you serious? Like, it's day four. We have three more days left, and there's no wine? you got to be kidding me. Like, Seriously, no more wine, no more wine. You know, we, we, we really need to get home. We have to get up really early tomorrow morning, you know. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's our reaction, right? Now, I can't overstate enough how big of a deal this would have been in the first century for a Jewish wedding. You have to understand that when it came to the first century weddings of the Jews, wine was an integral part of the celebration. 
In fact, believe it or not, there was an old Jewish saying back in the early first century that said this, without wine, there is no joy. Do I get an amen with that? Some of you guys just come as you are, right? Just be honest. Uh, That was how it was back then. Now, before some of you go crazy and get all super righteous about Jesus being in the middle of this wine fest and drunken, you know, whatever party or whatever, you have to understand that in those days, uh, wine was more of an essential drink than it was an avenue to get drunk. And that doesn't mean people didn't get drunk, but typically in wedding situations like this, most people Uh, controlled themselves, and it was just part of normal day life. It's not like our modern-day weddings where, let's be honest, we have an open bar, and we know people are going to get drunk, right? We know our crazy uncle or our ridiculous aunt or the lunatic co-worker that we had to invite gets too much wine or drinking in them, and they stand on the table, and they start dancing, you know, the chicken dance or something like that, right? That happens at all of our weddings. We know that that's that's true, Uh, but that's not what was happening here. But the wine was important. And the wine ran out. And no doubt it would have threatened the rest of the party. So Jesus' mother, Mary, comes to the rescue. At least she thinks she's coming to the rescue. And she gives this simple observation to her son, Jesus. Look at what happens. The wine supply ran out, verse 3 during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, she's talking to Jesus, turns to Jesus and says, they have no more wine. Wink, wink. (laughs) Now, I don't know if I can prove this, but I believe that Mary at that point had a sense that her son, she knew who he was. She had, she had we, we just studied about him uh, and this story of she had been told before he was born, this is the Messiah, the son of God. She knew who he was. I have a, I, have a, I believe, and I, I can't prove this, but I believe that Mary had a sense that her son Jesus, that this was the moment that for the very first time he was going to display the power of God in a big way. I can't prove this, but I really think Mary in this moment believed that, that in her heart that Jesus would supernaturally intervene and somehow fix the problem. She says, listen, Jesus, there's no more wine. But I think this would be a great time <laughs> to show people what you got. Like, It's as if Mary expected her son Jesus to do something big and supernatural. And it got me thinking this week. What if you and I, at the start of 2019, what if when we began to face the impossible challenges of our life, whatever those may be, or the limitations of life, What if our default was the same as Mary's and we would go to Jesus with the problem believing that he would do the impossible? Like how would that change your year this year? I mean, you want to to unlock the power of God in your life? There is nothing like that. You do what Mary does and you expect Jesus to do big things. See, I I think so much of what God is able to do in your life and in my life is determined by how much we believe and how much we give him the opportunity to do big things. I don't don't know what miracles you need right now in your life. I, I think probably all of us, if we were honest, there are things in our life where we can look at and say, this seems like an impossible situation. I need a miracle. Maybe that's your marriage right now and your marriage is just falling apart and and you're thinking to yourself, God, this is an impossible situation. I don't know how this is ever gonna be fixed. I need a miracle. And God, I'm just gonna come to you because I expect you to do big things in this marriage. Maybe it's your finances and and you've just been sinking in debt or you've been up and down in your finances and for the last 15, 20 years, you've never been, uh, feel secure about your financial situation and you just just look, you come to Jesus 
and say, Jesus, I I expect you to do something big in my finances. Maybe it's a relationship in your life. Maybe it's a family member that's gone sideways and and, and it's broken and it's hurting and and there's a lot of sadness and bitterness and anger and and you think it's an impossible situation and you look at it and say, I need a miracle. I'm going to expect Jesus to do something big. Maybe it's it's a, a life pattern that has become destructive in your life and your relationships. Maybe it's an addiction or a bad habit that you're like, I, I've tried everything that I can do to break this. I've, I've tried counseling. I've tried talking to people. I've tried prayer. I've tried everything. And I always keep on coming back to this. Maybe if you're like me, you, you try and try and try and try and you just can't get over it. Maybe this is the year Maybe this is the moment where you just turn to Jesus like Mary and say, listen, I know you have power. Do something powerful in this situation. Expecting Jesus to do big things. Listen, when you begin to take God out of the box that you've created for him, it will open the floodgates to what he can do in your life. Expect Jesus to do big things. That's what Mary is doing here. She knows who he is. She knows what he can do. It's interesting, though, Jesus' response. Look look at how Jesus responds. It's it's actually a little discouraging. Verse 4. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. On the surface, this seems like a very uh, rude response, right? First of all, he calls her woman, right? How many women in the room would love that for their son, or their daughters to say, hey, woman, you know, I mean, that's like, but back in the first century, this was just, just don't freak out on me. This was a sign of respect. This is a way that you would respect someone. Okay, so he says, dear woman, that's not my problem. Like, what's Jesus' deal? Is he a stick in the mud? He doesn't want to have all these trivial issues. You know, I've got more issues to deal with. I'm trying to save the world here. Give me a break type of thing. Like, what's going on with Jesus? And to be very, very careful here because on the surface, it would seem like Jesus is being incredibly rude and thoughtless and careless with this concern that Mary has. Don't misinterpret what Jesus says here. What Jesus is is trying to, to do here with his mom and the disciples and anybody else, there were other people around. He's making a distinction between his earthly mission and his ultimate calling. You see, his earthly mission was to uh, point people to God, to his Father in heaven. Everything he did, everything he said on earth was to point people to God. He said, he said, you can know me or you can know God by knowing me. If you know me, you, you know God. If, if you follow me, you follow God. Like his earthly mission was to point people to God. But he had an ultimate calling, and that ultimate calling was to die on a cross for my sins and your sins, to redeem us to our creator, to make things right with our creator. That was his ultimate calling. And Jesus is here, and he's not dismissing the opportunity that, that, that uh, lends itself here. Not at all. He's simply saying, hey, there is a distinction. Here's my earthly mission. Here's my ultimate calling. And you need to know that my ultimate calling of dying on a cross, I'm not ready for that yet. I've got things to do. Now, I don't know if Mary understood any of that. But I love her response to Jesus. Look at how she responds. It's a beautiful response. And man, if I had this response, my life would be different. Yours too. Verse 5. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. She's not talking as a mother now. She's talking as a disciple of Jesus, as a follower of Jesus. She recognizes who he is. And she says, hey, I I trust him. Whatever he wants to do, you do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Love that response. So look what happens. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Now you have to understand there were no paved roads in those days. Okay. This was pretty primitive. And so it was dusty. It was dirty. It was muddy. And they, they wore sandals. 
So you do the math. When you came into a party or to a house, your feet were nasty and dirty. Your hands were nasty and dirty. And so what they typically did at the beginning, at the entrance of the house, is they would have these jars of water and you would have to wash your feet and and wash your hands before you entered uh, the house. By the way, this is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do for us on the cross. And that time, it's not a physical cleansing. It's a soul cleansing where Jesus cleanses us from all of our sin and all of our mistakes and failures and redeems us back to God. But, but look what happens. Each of these, these six stone waters uh, jars could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though his servants knew where it came from, he called the bridegroom over. He says, a host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, right? We all know that. That's how it works, right? (laughs) But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Unbelievable miracle. Jesus takes some bath water and turns it into fine wine. Who does that? The question is this, that I wrestle with. Why did Jesus choose to do this miracle to be his first? Of all the miracles that Jesus did, or could have done? Why did he choose to do this one? And I've struggled with this and struggled with this, but this isn't rocket science. The, The answer is incredibly simple. There was an opportunity. That's it. Jesus put himself in the middle of people, and an opportunity came up for him to reveal his power to the people around him. And that's how it happened. You see, the sweet spot of any miracle that's going to happen in your life, write this down, know this. The sweet spot of any miracle in your life that's ever going to happen is is when God's providence, which means God's will, God's design, when God's providence collides with opportunity. That's the sweet spot. When you find that sweet spot, that's where miracles are going to happen. That's where the floodgates are going to happen. When God's will for your life collides with opportunity. The only way that you will ever experience the supernatural of God in your life is to give God an opportunity to do the supernatural. Well, how do I do that, Steve? I mean, that's that's good to hear, but how in the world am I supposed to do that? You do what Mary does. Simply put, she presents Jesus with a problem. There's no wine left. And then she trusts in him to do whatever he needs to do. That's how you provide an opportunity for God to do the supernatural in your life. You present Jesus. You come to Jesus. Here's my problem. Here's where I need the miracle. And I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. I'm going to surrender to you to do what you think is best. Now, uh, to close things out, it's interesting to me that this miracle, the emphasis isn't just on turning the water into wine, which is a very cool miracle, right? Like there are many days where I wish I had that power. Uh, but, but, But this is an incredible miracle. But notice that half of the emphasis is on the quality of the wine. Like they don't just stop with saying, you know, Jesus turned water into wine and everybody was happy. No, they, they, he, he makes a distinction. He says, listen, 
He says, this isn't the $5.99 bottle that you buy at Jewel, okay? This isn't wine in a box. This is the good stuff. And if you've ever tasted bad wine and really good wine, you know that there is a difference. They understood the difference. Why this emphasis? And I think it's because God wants to remind us, God wants to remind you as you sit here this morning that Jesus wants the best for you. Jesus wants the best for you. Notice, I didn't say that Jesus wanted your best. I said Jesus wants the best for you. See, I think sometimes we confuse the two. And sometimes we convince ourselves that our best is the best. And we convince ourselves that, that this is the best I will ever experience. This is what's best for me. But yet it's not what Jesus wants. It's not what God wants. I love this story because um, it reminds us, the people, when they were drinking this wine at the beginning of the celebration, they probably thought to themselves, not bad. Pretty good stuff. More, 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 more. That's why they ran out. They didn't know that the good stuff wasn't there yet. They didn't even know about the best stuff. They thought this was the best. But then Jesus comes along and says, hey, let me give you the best. This was your best before, but I'm going to give you the best. And I think it reminds us the same is true in my life and in your life. And we spend so much time in life pursuing our best, what we think is best. Instead, we need to focus and believe that Jesus will deliver us the best if we follow him. Make 2019 a commitment that you will no longer, no longer settle for your best. But you will pursue the best. And trust me when I say this, Jesus will always lead you to the best. And sometimes, yes, he'll do the supernatural in your life to make sure it happens. So I guess Stevie Wonder did have it right. Superstition ain't the way. Let's pray.